Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science in the Public, and thank you very much for the opportunity to co-sponsor this event with the Friends of the Robbins Library. Tonight, we welcome a really special person, Amy Smith, uh, the visionary, uh, founder and director of the award-winning D-Lab at MIT. D-Lab, which stands for Design, Develop, Disseminate, I think it still does, began with Amy Smith's Peace Corps work long ago, during which she realized that she could accomplish more if she could combine her engineering skills with her commitment to improving the lives of the people in struggling nations. When she returned to MIT for her master's, she organized a unique collaboration between engineering students and villagers in developing nations. The objective was to work with and train villagers to develop equipment and processes that would raise living standards even where resources and education were very limited. The D-Lab project took a lot of courage and persistence, and it has been a tremendous international success. Amy Smith has received many prestigious awards, both for her own engineering designs and for her outstanding humanitarian projects through the D-Lab, including a MacArthur Fellowship. In 2010, she was named by Time Magazine, one of the world's most influential people. And in this past year, she was also honored by the women of the Harvard Club as one of Boston's most influential women, a fact we all knew. Today, Amy <laughs> Smith is one of the lead organizers of the International Development uh, Design Summit. And it is held annually to study problems in the developing world and create real workable solutions and innovations. Her emphasis is always that the solutions to problems in developing nations require the collaboration of the people themselves. And she's, innovate, she's uh, initiated other projects. I'm not sure whether she's going to talk about them tonight, but you can go to the D-Lab website and see the numerous projects. And they're, at this point, pretty huge. In spite of her nonstop schedule, and I am not kidding on that, Amy Smith has been very kind to agree to talk with folks at the Robbins Library tonight because it's her old neighborhood. It's a very great honor to welcome a true emissary for the humble around the world, so many of whom she has helped to discover their own abilities. And we welcome Amy Smith for the D-Lab. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And um, it's very nice to be here. I moved out of Arlington several years ago, but I used to live just around the corner on Pond Lane. And I, I love to be able to come here to the library and just um, sit down and read books occasionally. Um, as I got busier, I frequented this place much less often. And I think this is the first time I've been here in a decade, but it's nice to be back. Um, yeah, so the title is um, a little variation on the Ds. So um, on our website, it says Development, Design, Dissemination, and Dialogue. Um, but these three, I think, uh, capture a little bit of the ethos of, of D-Lab design and that we believe that technology can and should make a difference in the lives of people living in poverty. Dialogue, because we believe that it's important to talk to people, to understand the context, to understand the needs, and to work in collaboration with people. And duct tape, because that in many ways exemplifies the sort of the do-it-yourself, can-do, oops, got to fix it mentality that development is really all about. So that's sort of the, the D's that um, uh, comprise a little bit of the talk tonight. Uh, so I wanted to start with just a little bit of the, the history of D-Lab. 
Uh, we started about 10 years ago. Uh, it was a class that actually, we called it the Haiti class, and it focused on Haiti, and it was just two classes. Um, in the fall, we uh, learned about Haiti and issues of development. During MIT's January break, I took the students to Haiti, and we worked with Peace Corps volunteers there to identify problems, and then we came back to MIT, and we worked on those problems, and then students had a chance to go back again over the summer to implement them. And, um, and it was a remarkable thing. Uh, the students really got engaged. There was a lot of um, positive things that came out of it and other student groups around campus said oh well shouldn't we do that in India what about Brazil and so we um, the next year rather than calling it the Haiti India Brazil class we came up with the name DLab um, and uh, and it's grown substantially from then uh, to where now we offer over 16 different classes that are sponsored by different um, departments around the Institute we have close to 400 students engaged in the program we have projects in over 20 different countries and we have four um, large research programs in addition to um, the sort of the classes that we offer. So there's really, uh, it's uh, grown tremendously, um, part of the reason why I don't come to the library anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, and so there's a, a sort of the philosophical underpinnings of D-Lab. Well, first of all, it's about real projects for real people. Um, a lot of times, uh, classes develop things for the developing world, and a lot of those solutions, when they're that generic, don't actually solve real problems. So that's one thing that we're very um, we stress. We focus on solutions for people living on less than three dollars a day. Typically, people living on one or two dollars a day, but we always have a, a poverty uh, focus and a technology focus. Um, it's not that we. We believe that technology is the only answer. In fact, we know it's only part of the answer, but um, that's the, the focus that we uh, choose. Uh, we're very much about hands-on and experiential learning, both within the context of our classes, but also in the way that we do development work and the way that we engage people in the community. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we believe in multidisciplinary approaches. So even though we have a technology focus, our students learn um, interviewing skills. We um, teach them language, culture, economics, et cetera, all of this to try to get a good uh, understanding of what development is all about. We focus on working with communities, not just for communities, and we really focus on building capacity in the communities. So that's a little bit, uh, in a nutshell, of what D-Lab is. Um, it's, uh, as Yvonne says, it's actually a lot more than that. Um, in the last year, we've, uh, well, our staff has gone from like five people a couple years ago to now we have over 30, so we have lots of programs. I think I know them all. I don't know if I do, So, uh, but that's a, a little snapshot of it. Uh, what I wanted to do, I thought it was particularly appropriate um, at a library, was to share a collection of um, short stories about different projects and technologies, and then sort of um, talk a little bit about what um, what we can draw from those stories. So I wanted to share just a few of the different technologies that have been developed by D-Lab over the years, and um, yeah, so we'll uh, go from there. So we'll start with the, the phase change incubator. And this story uh, is a good one to uh, talk about this community here, which is a community of Guadalupe Carne. It's in northern Honduras. And it's a home of, uh, of progressive farmers who were, dis who were displaced by Hurricane Mitch in 1999. And they formed a cooperative uh, here in Guadalupe Carne. And the uh, um, farmers are very knowledgeable about water and water issues. They have two water sources in the, um, in the community. Uh, one of them is a pipe system that comes from the surrounding hillside, uh, and this is the water that they use for drinking and in the homes. And the other are a series of these shallow hand, uh, um, hand dug wells with uh, pumps on top of them, and these are the ones that they use for washing. Right? And, um, and so we were doing some work in, uh, in this area, and one of the things that we found, we did some water quality testing, and we found that, um, unfortunately, the water they were drinking that was coming from the hills was actually contaminated, and the water that they were washing with, with was actually clean. Right? <laughs> so um, of this sort of is a great example of how important it is for um, communities to be able to do their own water quality testing so that they can measure and monitor the quality of their um, water and do something about it. So um, the phase change incubator is a device that looks like this. Um, it uses the, uh, the phase change of a material to maintain a constant temperature. 
And um, the reason you would want to do that because, is because the way you test for water quality is that you take a sample of the water and you grow that bacteria at human body temperature. And if there are bacteria uh, that grow at human body temperature, you'll see them, right? And you can tell whether the water is contaminated. If there aren't any um, bacteria that grow at human body temperature, um, at the end of the 24 hours, you'll, um, you'll see a negative result. But the important thing is to be able to keep the water samples at, that 20, um, at human body temperature for that 24 hours so that you can see whether or not the bacteria are there. Normally, this requires an incubator that requires electricity. But a phase change incubator doesn't. Um, inside each of these balls is a little bit of chemical that melts at 37 degrees centigrade. So just as an ice cube, um, I don't know, think back to junior high school science, when you melted that ice cube and it stayed at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees centigrade until the entire thing was melted, right? While it's changing phase, there's a constant temperature. So if we can just find a chemical who has that constant temperature at our body temperature, then we could use that in order to maintain a temperature without having to have any electricity. As long as we could heat these um, balls in um, boiling water or in the sun, it will maintain that constant temperature throughout the time of the water quality test. So using this device, we were able to work with communities all over the world and enable them to test their water and then to be able to treat it as appropriate. So this is a community um, a, a training program that we did with a community in um, in Zambia and um, here they had the the incubator and one of the things that they particularly liked about it was that it was portable right and part of the reason they liked that is because we were doing water quality tests wanted to make sure that I wasn't doing anything to the test. So they're like, okay, we'll put it in and we're going to keep <laughs> the incubator with us. So they did that and then they were able to see the results of the test. And one of the things that it shows is oftentimes the water in the well is clean and then the water in the bucket that you carry home is somewhat contaminated. The water in the home is even more contaminated because the transport and the storage are the issues. And so if you can show where the contamination occurs, then people can take, um, they can take action in treating that. So being able to do water quality monitoring is an important thing. And something like the phase change incubator allows that. We've recently also expanded it into areas of medical diagnostics. So um, here we're working on doing some blood culture work for um, diagnosing uh, tuberculosis. And more recently, we're working in, um, in Nepal uh, on a program to diagnose uh, typhoid and paratyphoid. So this simple piece of laboratory equipment, which by the way, is not only um, more appropriate in rural settings, but it also is cheaper. A battery operated incubator costs costs over a thousand dollars and one of these costs a little over a hundred dollars. So, um, so it's a kind, an example of the type of technology that we try to develop in D-Lab. One that's low cost, one that uses sort of a, a simple innovative system for, um, for doing what it needs to do. The next uh, story I want to tell you about is uh, about a, a student of mine whose name is Jody Wu and the project that she worked on uh, which is a mobile maize sheller. So in developing country, maize is a staple crop, and typically people grow it in the fields, they dry it in the fields, they store it, and then they're, when they're ready to prepare the food, they take the maize, they remove the kernels by hand, and then they grind it into flour and make either porridge or tortillas or whatever um, is appropriate. And um, this processing is very labor intensive. So Jody was in my class, and one of the things that I do is I like to teach my students about all different types of technologies. And so one of the things that she learned about were these two technologies that were developed by an organization in Guatemala called Maya Pedal. This is a device that grinds corn, and this is a device that shells corn or removes the um, or kernels of corn from the ear. And uh, Jody was not traveling to Guatemala in the class, she was traveling to Tanzania. And she knew that maize was a staple crop there, so she thought, maybe I could bring these machines with me and see whether or not there would be an interest because they didn't have this type of machine in the community she was traveling to. So the first thing Jody did to, um, was to learn how to weld <laughs> so that she could make one of these and we sort of we redesigned it a little bit so that it would be easier to pack into a suitcase and, uh, and she made one of these mobile maize, uh, sorry, she made one of these maize shellers to take with her to Tanzania. So when she got there people tried it out and she talked to them about what they thought about the device. 
And what she found was that people liked it. Um, it's fast. It's about 40 times faster than doing it by hand, and it's got a really neat mechanism on it. But people didn't want something that was that big, heavy, and expensive. In Guatemala, it was designed for women with um, you know, traditional dresses to be able to sit so they could do embroidery at the same time as um, shelling corn. Um, in uh, Tanzania, it was young men who wanted to be able to do this, and they wanted to start businesses going from farm to farm, shelling people's maize on the farms. So this wasn't a good design for what their needs were, but Jody found out what it was. What was. So she came back after her trip, and she said, Amy, I've got a great idea for a project. I want to make a mobile maize sheller. So in the second semester class, which is the design class, she put forward the project to her, um, her uh, peers, and a number of people shared her enthusiasm. And they worked together to create a mobile maze sheller. So here you can see the same device, but now fitting on the back of a bike. There's a, a gear train that goes and connects to a sprocket, which is on the back wheel. And then you can just raise the bike onto a rack. And you can ride there with the machine, put the um, rack underneath, and then uh, shell the corn. So Jody went back to Tanzania and worked with some folks in the workshop there to further improve the design and to build it locally. And here is the, um, the Scheller in action. And um, the young gentleman, Loyoyo, actually, in just a month, earned enough money from the maize Scheller in order to pay for it. Right? So that was pretty exciting. And Jody um, you know, just came back. Uh, once again transformed and in this case she wanted to sort of harness the power of bicycles um, to create pedal powered machines to improve the lives of people in rural areas and so she um, thought you know there's so much potential here I want to start a business I want to start an organization that does this so DLAP has a collection of classes and one of them is called development ventures so she took that class and she developed a business plan and she got additional teammates to join. And this was a, a few years ago, but she, um, she entered MIT's 100K competition, which is an entrepreneurial competition that has $100,000 in prizes. And if you look carefully here, <laughs> you'll see um, that she won the development track. And, um, and not only that, she won the Audience Choice Award. So she got $50,000 to continue on with her, um, her business. So she... Um, Mm. Sorry. Uh, she moved back to Tanzania, and she actually started a business, which is called Global Cycle Solutions. And um, they have a variety of products that they um, that they developed. Jody herself won an Echoing Green Fellowship. She was announced one of America's most promising social entrepreneurs, and she sort of learned what it's like to be a CEO of a company where you do all sorts of, of different things. Since then, the company's had its ups and downs, and it's redefining itself. But she's still in Tanzania, and she's still working on a variety of projects, and um, is still an inspiration to me and the students throughout D-Lab. Um, that's the second story. Uh, the third story takes us back to Honduras. We sort of do a lot of ping pong between Honduras and Tanzania because of just the way the projects work out. So this is another um, water project that we worked on in a different village in um, Bonito Oriental. And uh, after Hurricane Mitch, there were a number of water tanks that were installed that looked like this. And they have a big water tank, and then on top there's a tank that um, contains a concentrated chlorine solution. So as the water comes into the tank, the chlorine solution also drips into the tank, and um, depending on the flow rate of the water, you adjust the flow rate of the chlorine, and you have proper chlorinated, um, properly chlorinated water. Now you may notice this complex flow control device here. <laughs> Um, and in fact, that is a great on-off switch, right? It is a terrible flow controller. Um, <laughs> we spent uh, quite a number of hours sitting on top of this water tank just measuring the drip rate of that. And in 30 seconds, it decreases by 200%, right? So it becomes a third of what it had been before. And so the, you know, the community could tell that the water was not being treated properly. And they blamed the plumber. And they said that the plumber was lazy. And then, of course, the plumber blamed the equipment. And so one thing we were able to do was we were able to confirm that the plumber was right. It was the equipment. But then we thought a little bit about, well, what could we do to, um, to adjust for this, right? So to take something like this, which is not a flow control device, and make one using locally available materials. Not only locally available materials, but locally available materials that a person like me with really crappy Spanish can find and <laughs> communicate. So, um, so what we did was we took, um, so here's the, 
here's the tap, and then we took some PVC tubing, connected it to a toilet valve, connected that to a gas uh, container, and then put a, a UV drip here. So the toilet valve controls the level in the, um, in the gas tank, um, or the gas, uh, I call it, container, and then the, um, the UV dripper contains the flow rate coming out of it. So you don't have fluctuations in the height of the, um, the level of the chlor chlorine, which means you don't have variations in the pressure and therefore the flow rate due to that, and you can control it very precisely. So, um, so this is the, the system that we uh, developed right here is the roll of duct tape in case you're wondering. So we installed it in here and we set the flow rate at 23 drops per minute. Um, and this is the system as it looks sort of uh, fully installed. And, um, and you'll notice that this actually looks a little bit different than that one. And part of that is because when we, um, we started uh, working together with the plumber, and we had conceptually designed it, but I'm not a plumber, and, you know, and multiple times he said, oh, oh, wait, we should change this. So you'll notice that the, P the rigid PVC pipe has been replaced by this flexible tube, which makes it much easier to install because it doesn't have to be precisely lined up. You can just sort of let the tube take care of the um, inconsistencies there. And there's a variety of things that he did to improve upon on this design as we installed it and created it together. So one of the things that um, that showed was the, sort of the value of working with, um, with sort of uh, the local community in improving the quality of the solutions. But the thing that was also interesting was to notice the uh, change in demeanor of the, um, the plumber, the originally maligned plumber, um, <laughs> who uh, originally he sort of, he was uh, often late to our meetings, et cetera. But then once we got really engaged in the design and fixing the problem, et cetera, he was always there early. Like as soon as he found somebody, he's like, wait a second, and jump on his bicycle to go get the next part, et cetera. So it was really interesting to see sort of this transformation that happened not only of the flow dripper, but also of the, the person who was involved with it. So as I said, we set it to 23 drops per minute. We went back the next day, 23 drops per minute. A year later, some students came back. So here it is, a year later. Interestingly, still 23 drops per minute. That was good. But it's interesting too, right? Because this doesn't really look anything like this, right? <laughs> it's not even the same container. It's, you know, the duct tape jury rig thing is totally different. It's now got a nice container that can be lifted on and off the ladder so that when the plumber needs to go into the tank to clean it, he doesn't have to climb over this thing duct taped to the side of his ladder. Um, and so he continued to um, improve upon the design. And originally, I was kind of embarrassed by the, um, you know, I really am a trained mechanical engineer, and this is pretty kludgy, right? <laughs> but if I had made something really slick and awesome that, you know, that wasn't instantly understandable, then Don Herman would not have been able to improve upon it and to really understand it and to, um, to do these improvements in the evolution of the design. So in a way, this sort of this, this crappy prototype gave rise to capacity building in um, Don Herman. But the thing which is all the more wonderful about this photo right, is not just the improved design here, but this guy here. Um, this guy here doesn't even live in this village. He's come from another village to learn how to make this from Don Herman so that he can install one in his water tank in his village. So Don Herman went from being, you know, the maligned plumber to now being the local expert who people come in and talk to. A really interesting thing was that a couple years later, you know, this was sort of on the shelf, um, although I do have one more um, a grand finale to the story, but some of our students were back and they were working in another community and they were working on a water project and it, they they, um, they needed to chlorinate the water, and someone was like, oh, you should go talk to this guy, Don Herman. And so in the end, he ended up teaching the, the D-Lab students the technology that previous D-Lab students had to, you know. <laughs> anyway, so it was a, a really nice cycle. But the thing which is really cool is that, um, so the organization that we work with there has taken that de design and integrated it into all of the um, water tanks that they now produce. So it looks, it looks a little less kludgy now, right? So what they do is they have the chlorine tank and then this is the, um, the tank that essentially contains the, um, the flow control device and the, the dripper valve, but it's now integrated into the design, right? And so you see that sort of by engaging with the community in co-creation, Things took a life that they never would have if it had just been us saying, here's your, here's your technology. So, um, so that's sort of uh, the dialogue part and the co-creation, which is an important part of what we try to do.
um, which moves us to the, um, the next uh, story. So um, Bernard uh, Kiva and IDDS. So IDDS is the International Development Design Summit. So as you can tell, I get kind of excited by this, working together with all these people um, with, on different projects and the amazing thing that happens. And so I said, what if we got all the amazing people who we work with in Tanzania, in Honduras, in Ghana, in all, all over the world, and we brought them to MIT and we said, let's work on creating like things. I, I hate academic conferences where you get all these people with all this knowledge and like it's only papers that's the only thing that comes out of it right so I was like let's just make prototypes so we'll have this massive working meeting we had 50 people from 20 countries we spent four weeks um, working at MIT to um, to create technologies and it was amazing but the thing that was really amazing was the effect that it had on the people who um, who were there so I'm going to tell you the story of Bernard and the story of um, Carlos. So this is Carlos Machan, and he actually works at that place, Maya Pedal, that I told you about before, right? And he's a bicycle mechanic and a technician who creates these agricultural technologies out of bicycle parts. This is Bernard uh, Kiwia, and he's a bicycle mechanic from Tanzania. Mm -hmm. These are the types of things that Carlos has at his, um, that Carlos produces in his workshop. This is a pedal-powered water pump, this is a pedal powered blender that makes, um, you can make juice or these women are making shampoo for a micro enterprise that they have. And these are those um, processing machines that I showed you about before. If you go to Bernard's workshop, you'll see this. Uh, so Bernard worked at an orphanage and the orphanage would get shipments of broken down bicycles from the United States. He trained orphans to repair them, to sell them in order to support the orphanage. So Bernard knows how to fix bikes. All of a sudden, he meets Carlos, and he sees some of these things, and he's like, whoa, I have all these Anyway, so Colar, Car um, Bernard goes home. One of my students, in fact, it was Judy, Jody Wu, visited Bernard on her trip in Tanzania just for a couple days to see what was going on. And it was pretty amazing what was going on. This is just a couple months after the end of IDDS. And Bernard had built his own pedal-powered um, water pump. This is a different design. The other one was a rope pump. This is a diaphragm pump. And um, so completely original design, but um, based on the idea that he got by meeting Carlos and by, um, yeah. Another thing uh, that he did was uh, he created a windmill. Um, they had a radio in the workshop, and the guys liked to listen to music while they were working. But they always, the batteries were always running out. Batteries in the developing world have a shelf, li well, a, a working life of about 20 minutes, it seems like. So he decided to um, build a windmill. And you know, Bernard loves building things out of bicycles. And if you look very carefully, you'll see the bike wheel up here and the hub, and then just everything else is what you need to make energy from that. Um, you know, and you know, this was the thing that we found was really powerful. That so Bernard went in as a bicycle mechanic. He was a good bicycle mechanic, but at I IDDS, he sort of he learned about innovation and invention and the design process. And then it was amazing the things that he came up with. And this is one of the um, very remarkable. Uh, let's see if I can get this to work. No, I think I have to do it this way. Yeah. So this is a pedal-powered hacksaw that he developed so ah, slick huh so um, so the weight of this um, of this mechanism here holds the the blade against the um, against the metal and it cuts the metal this is a pedal powered um, drill press so you um, use the sprocket here in the chain to raise and lower the um, the table put your piece in sit down pedal and drill ah. Pretty remarkable for a young man who I think has a junior high school education, right? Uh, very few of my MIT students could actually do this, right? <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, um, so we realized through IDDS that we weren't just creating new technologies, right? We were creating new technologists, and that was equally as important, or perhaps more important. And um, and we recognized that a lot of uh, a lot of this creative capacity is just uh, overlooked, right? And the way that we do development now is pretty much giving people um, technologies. Uh, I was at a meeting in Washington, and someone, someone said this phrase, which um, scared me. They said, education is important so that people can learn to use the technologies we choose to give them. <laughs> ah! Right? That's not the attitude you want. <laughs> Education is important so people can learn to create the technologies they need to change their lives and to improve their livelihoods. Right. So uh, that led, gave rise to this uh, project that we um, uh, started doing in Uganda. So we, um, 
we were asked to go to northern Uganda in the um, time as people were uh, recovering from the conflict. The, um, the LRA conflict recently got a big, uh, a lot of people heard a lot more of, out of it because of the Kony 2012 um, thing. But for 20 years, there was civil war and one of the most brutal, um, brutal wars on the planet in northern Uganda. And uh, a lot of people didn't know about it, but millions of people lived in camps like this. Each of these huts would uh, contain probably 20 to 50 people inside. And they lived in these camps for about 20 years. Um, in 2007, peace broke out and people started moving back to the villages and back through transition camps. And the organization that we were working with would ask us to come so that we could maybe share some technologies that would help ease that transition and reduce the burden of labor, especially on women, when you go from having everything supplied at a camp to having to get everything to fetch water, firewood, to grow crops again, etc. There's a, a lot of things that, that um, we've been working on at DLAB or that we know about that we thought might be able to help. So that's what, um, why we went, but when we were there, we realized uh, usually we work with sort of local blacksmiths and, um, and woodworkers to create these technologies so that people could use them, but there weren't, right? In 20 years, a lot of the capacity was lost. So we thought, well, let's just teach everyone how to do it. And so we started this pro program that we call Creative Capacity Building. And what we did was we sort of adapted that curriculum from IDDS and from the classroom that I teach at, um, at MIT. And we adapted it so that you could do it um, in this type of setting. So under a shade tree or a mango tree with people with um, limited literacy levels. So when we do a sign-in sheet, probably half of the people sign in with their thumbprint rather than writing their name. So how could we adapt it so that we could do this sort of curriculum and people would engage in in, um, the design process and sort of uh, feel, you know, feel like they can create the things that they need to improve their lives. And uh, there's sort of a variety of ways that we do that. And uh, you may recall that I mentioned that uh, one of the things that DLab is about is experiential learning and hands-on activities. So I thought we might take a little break here and do one of the activities that we do in, um, with these training groups. And um, we're a little low on time, but I'm going to just try to make it happen anyway. So what I'd like you to do is, uh, well, I'll tell you what the challenge is first. And then you'll split into teams of four. And then you'll come and you'll get your supplies from me. And we'll work, we probably have about 10 minutes to do it. So it's going to be a little accelerated compared to the time that we take in the field. But it's good to get you out of your chairs and doing something active. So the challenge is this. Uh, these are the books that the library has. And the challenge is that sometimes water comes in here, and we don't want these books to be water damaged. So you need to design something that will keep the, water, the books at least six inches off the ground. And you want, to carry, you want to support as many books as you can. Now the challenge is that the only material that you have to do this with is that you get two pieces of paper. OK. And uh, I'll just say no now because that's pretty much going to be the answer to the question that you ask you know can i use my chair no can i use no you can't glue it you can't staple it you can't take your spiral bounding and use have no okay you can fold it you can manipulate the paper you can't add anything to it so what we'll do is um is we'll just get you in groups of about four people you'll have um why don't we say yeah we'll just say 10 minutes right and we'll see how many um each group will get um uh, you'll get some scrap paper, um, which you can play around with, and that's the way, um, and then at the end of, uh, we'll maybe give you like a two minute morning, and then you're going to build your final structure, and we'll see how many books you're able to support. And it's got to be how off the ground? Uh, about, about six inches off the ground. Six inches off the ground. Yeah. And how many books? One each? One each? As many as you can. Okay. So, any other questions? See, not all the answers were no, but I just wanted to get those no's out of the way. All right, so, so find a, uh, get a group of four people, and then come on up and, yeah. Only two pieces for the final design? Oh, only two pieces for the final design. Hi, Wilma, how are you? <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. but you can play around with the white paper. I'll, I'll come around. So, your design. <laughs> okay. So, um, let's see how many books um, various teams got, and we'll try to just, in a unfortunately competitive way, kind of just sort of 
Uh, if you can outdo the people who just said how many they did, go ahead and do that. Normally when we do this, we do go around and we ask every team to show what we did, they did, etc. But we just don't have the time this evening. So um, please know that I care deeply about your design and want to know and to give you feedback on it. But um, yeah, but we could do that privately afterwards. So how did we do? Nine so far. Nine so far and still going. Four. What do we got there? Seven, but I see some hard covers. Yeah. Five. Six. Fourteen. You guys better keep stacking. So this is a great activity because I remember at one point I well when we do it in the um, in the field we don't use books because there aren't that many books there but um, but we do it with ears of corn harder to balance than books and um, and so we. Um, we sort of, we started, you know, with uh, with some simple designs. It actually started raining, so we had to move inside. And we encouraged people to think of lots of different ideas rather than just a standard approach. And so by the end, we ended up with all these different ways of stacking corn. And it was really interesting. And I, you know, I love this project because, or this particular activity because it. It's a very easy, easily manipulable material. So it doesn't matter if you have experience with tools or you don't have experience with tools, you can bend and fold and, and tear paper. Also, you do something you didn't think you were going to be able to do. And that's really important because that's one of the things that design does, right? You, there's a problem that hasn't been solved and you can create a solution to it. That's a really important thing for people to get out. Right. And I remember one time there was a woman and I, you know, I gave out the two pieces of paper and she gave me this look like, are you on drugs? What do you mean? <laughs> and her team stacked 22 ears of corn on two pieces of paper, which is uh, pretty remarkable. And, um, and at the end, she was just beaming. I mean, it was just, it was tremendous. So this is just a little activity in the three-day curriculum that we do, but a really interesting one. And we've adapted it a little bit. Um, at the IDDS that we ran in Brazil last year, um, the organizers like, Amy, we want you to do that design exercise. I said, great. And they said, we're going to have 200 people in the audience. I was like, Oh, so what we did was we, um, we adapted it. So instead of everyone doing the same thing, there were different things. So you either had oranges, bananas, or apples. And then you would either try to support as many fruit as you could, support it as high as you could, or support it as beautifully as you could, right? <laughs> and then you see you get very different designs depending on what your design constraints are. So I actually like it better with this idea of giving people different um, different constraints because it shows that. And then also you get away from some of the, um, the petty competition that can happen between when everyone's doing the same thing. Yeah. So, um, so this is just sort of one of the introductory activities, but we go through and we teach people the full design process. And um, in so doing, they, um, they create prototypes as uh, we give them a, a sample challenge that we go through. Um, oftentimes, or in this case, it was to create a device that could remove the peanuts um, from the plant, uh, a peanut thresher. And you know, these are just in the course of, they really had uh, one and a half uh, days, they developed seven different prototypes for um, removing peanuts, right? And this was a, a group of people who had been removed, I mean, the culture had been removing peanuts by hand forever and quite honestly complaining about it because whenever I would um, you know, come and say, are there ideas for technologies, people would say, oh, is there anything we can use to get the peanuts off of the plants? And so to you know, engage people in this idea of um, you know, creating these technologies for things that they had been doing in a laborious way to just rethink it, right? And then they start thinking about, well, you know, this is a pain too. Maybe we could do this, et cetera. So we did this curriculum. Uh, as I said, it's about a three-day curriculum, and then we went home. And you never know how these things are going to take, right? And like, I don't know. Are you guys going to go home and get rid of your bookshelves and just use two pieces of paper? <laughs> I don't know. So. Well, we went back to the village six months later, and it was amazing. So this was the, the community, and they're sort of showing the different technologies that they made in the intervening months. So this is a pedal-powered grinder for sharp, sharpening um, knives and machetes and hoes. This is a water cart that allows a woman to carry all the water that she needs from the well in a single day instead of having to go multiple trips. This village is three and a half kilometers from the well, so you could imagine why it might be nice to get all eight um, jerry cans at the same time instead of having to go back and forth. 
<laughs> this is a sugar cane crusher that they developed so that they could um, collect the juice out of sugar cane, which has much more value than the cane itself. These are, this was a technology that we had demonstrated to show them, um, which is the pot in a pot. Um, I'll talk about it a little bit more later, but it's an evaporative cooler that extends the shelf life of fresh fruits and vegetables. And um, the potter in the community had actually worked out a deal where she would make the pots for people if they would um, uh, sort of um, was a plow her fields. So that the time she was spending making the pots, they were um, making it so she could still farm. This is a threshing table that allows you to, uh, another way to remove peanuts from the, the plant. Uh, these things back here are rat traps that are made out of wire. Um, and uh, in the developing world, uh, more than 20% of the crop is lost to, um, to uh, post-harvest losses. And so um, Patrick, this man here, had, um, had heard about these rat traps, and so he wanted to make them. Uh, they didn't, they're made out of wire. They didn't have any wire in the village. So he took an old tire, burnt the rubber off of it, and used the wire from the, um, the steel belted radial to, in order to make these traps. So the interesting thing about all of these technologies is they're all income generating as well, right? So these guys earn a um, 1,000 shillings for sharpening each, you know, each knife or machete or whatever they sharpen. These women will rent this cart out if someone's doing a construction site um, and they need to be bringing water or sand in order to be building. Um, this allows you to earn more money from your sugar cane. This allows you to keep your um, vegetables longer so you can sell them um, at a higher price. This, well, uh, he's selling these, um, he now has five different designs of um, rat traps um, that he sells for two or three thousand shillings each. And then this one here, the woman who makes it um, also sort of sells the table. So it's pretty remarkable. Um, and then we, uh, we went back again six months later, a whole bunch of new designs. It was awesome. But what was particularly awesome was not the technologies here, but rather the place. So this is the technology center where the group, um, they had acquired land. They created a technology group. And this is where they come together to meet and to have, um, when we did our next training sessions, we did them here at this site. And, they, um, and there's a, a place for them to convene and to work on technologies together. Um, there were several of these groups because when we did the training, there were people from different communities. So this was a community um, who had built the training center uh, or the, um, the site. Uh, this is a group that was putting the roof on and uh, we were lucky to be able to help them roof their technology center, which was very cool. But the reason why I love this, pro um, this uh, picture, there's a quote that goes along with it. Uh, the woman who makes those threshing tables. We were trying to just sort of uh, gauge the impact of the training on people, and especially women, because women traditionally do not use tools in these cultures. So we asked a variety of questions, and you know, one of them was like, you know, if this chair was broken, would you be able to fix it? Oh, yes. Would you have been able to fix it before the training? Oh, no. I feared the hammer. <laughs> and um, so the thing I love about this picture is here is Alice, you know, wailing away on these nails to put the roof on the building. Not only does she not fear the hammer, she doesn't fear it so much that she's able to improvise a hammer out of an ax, right? Well, I mean, no, it's right. So, so, I mean, it's a level of comfort of tools to be able to improvise the use of another tool for that tool. And I just feel like it speaks volumes to the capacity building that happens when you do exercises and training and you actually believe that people are creative and capable and competent and not vulnerable and poor and needy, right? And so that's sort of a really important um, thing that comes out of that. Um, so that goes to sort of the, um, a little philosophy. Um, and uh, these stories sort of uh, encapsulate the evolution of, um, I was at a conference and they had Plato for fidgety people. So um, <laughs> anyway, so if you want to think about the, um, the evolution of the D-Lab philosophy, if you think about that incubator, that was something that I designed sort of um, for a need that I perceived, but it really wasn't co-creation. There's merit in it and there's, there's use to it. Um, then we provided students for people like Jody to, um, to go and interact with the community more. And then the uh, chlorination was a uh, moving along that spectrum spectrum um, involving in co-creation, and then the capacity building that we did um, uh, through IDDS and this uh, creative capacity building program. And if you want to think about it in terms of a sort of an evolution of prepositions, that there's sort of starting with is to design for the developing world, and then changing that to design with people in the um, developing world, and then with the goal of having designed by people in the developing world. And so that's really the evolution of, um, of the D-Lab philosophy. Um, hmm. 
Yeah, so we're a little late. I'm going to zip through these slides, uh, a little more philosophical underpinnings, but just some of the things that have shaped our, our approach over the years are first the idea of appropriate technology, which is, um, you know, sort of became popular in the 70s and 80s. Prior to that, there were all these big technology projects, and Ernst Schumacher came, um, sort of said, uh, he wrote a book called Small is Beautiful, and the, um, the subtitle was Economics as if People Mattered. Right? And he was the first person to look at how do these big development things affect individual people. And a lot of the human development indicators that we have now come out of this, um, that sort of approach to economics. And so appropriate technologies sort of said, what if we created technologies that can work in the environment where people are living? So things like that pot in the pot or a treadle pump or this is a, a, a small machine for making um, roofing tiles. And they're appropriate in different ways. This is in an area where maybe there aren't a whole lot of external resources. Here, um, there's electricity in the village in India. A lot of villages have been electrified. So there, um, this uses an electric motor. And so being really conscious about what is appropriate. And that's evolved over time. The next movement that really has shaped the way we do things is this idea of participatory development. And that um, became popular in the 1980s and 90s, which is just a travesty. So participatory development says, why don't you ask people what their needs are? <laughs> And revolutionarily, um, yeah, that became popular. So, um, so th if you think about appropriate technology, it talks a little bit about um, the the what kind of technology participatory development is involving, um, uh, the, how you go about doing it, and then uh, creative capacity building is about the um, the um, the who is doing the technology creation. So um, if this is the way we envision the design process as a way of sort of going from a problem to a solution through a series of steps, if we were to look at that, um, the appropriate technology uh, movement sort of had community involvement <coughs> It was good, though. Uh, <laughs> community involvement up here at the solution level, right? People came in with the technology, and they said, what did you think? The idea of participatory development is that it um, engages, hmm, there we go, engages people here in identifying the problems. And the idea of creative capacity building is that you have community involvement throughout the entire design process. And so this is a lot of what we're trying to do in D-Lab, is to, um, is to uh, really shift the paradigm of development so that it's not a donation-based model that the technology experts aren't external but that you're creating technology um, experts internally because in the long run that's how sustainable development is going to happen right if you always have to get things from outside then you're always going to be dependent it's not to say that every community has to be self-sufficient we aren't I mean I didn't make this computer <laughs> and, um, you know but but to just have that capacity to be able to you know think of yourself as a problem solver and to solve those problems and to have the capacity capacity to do it. So a little bit of the technology and the philosophy of D-Lab. Kind of felt like um, I want, I, so I wanted to close with a library story because we're in a library. I love libraries. Um, I grew up two blocks away from the East Lexington Branch Library and um, would go there all the time. It's a really interesting thing. I'm not really a reader. I'm not a person who actually retains knowledge through reading. I can take a mystery book, read it, turn it over, read it again, and not know who did it. I mean, it's <laughs> easy to travel. One book, that's all I need. If it was well written, it's perfect, right? But I love libraries. I love being around books. Um, I know I could read them infinitely, right? Because I never remember a single thing about any of them. And I love that you can find, and like there's an order for knowing, like there's a, it's a treasure place, right? And there's a, there's a map. Every, you know, used to be a card catalog. I loved card catalogs. Now I don't like computers, so it's a little disappointing. But anyway, so a library story. And I actually ended up working at that library, and then I lived here. And, and so uh, we work with a community in Ghana. And um, we uh, work with, uh, this, this is the primary school there. And I have a friend who's a teacher at a primary school in Lexington. So I thought, hey, would you guys like to do a partnership? And she said, sure. And so her kids collected some books, and I brought a Xerox box full of books. And, um, and we gave them to the school. And the school said, thank you very much. And uh, a number of people said, we're going to build a library. I was like, it was like a Xerox box full of books. But in any case, they're like, let's build it. So went back a few months later, and they had plans a library so um, they and they had talked to the district assembly about maybe getting a donation of roofing sheets and um, they talked to the village chief and the chief allocated some land and the people in the community made a bunch of blocks and they cleared the land and they carried the blocks to the work site 
and um, we, uh, we travel to this community every January with our um, students and we, um, our students were very fortunate to be able to spend some time helping to build um, the library. And uh, we learned a lot. <laughs> We're not very good at this, but um, they let us help. And we, um, you know, it was a pretty uh, great experience to, you know, put up the walls to learn how to be Masons. And um, the thing that was a little frustrating though is we went back the next year, and the library was at about the same. Um, the no one had put the next course of blocks on. So we said, OK. And we, we you know, got the D-Lab team together. And we put another layer of, of blocks. And the next year, we went back. And there hadn't been much progress. And so we talked to the community at a community meeting. And it turns out there wasn't actually as much enthusiasm for the library as that we thought there was. So we talked to them and said, well, what, you know, we have this site. We've started. And they said, well, you know, there is no senior secondary school, in, not even in our village, but in our whole region. Uh, they are, um, the name of their tribe is the, um, the Deg Mo, and there is, no, um, there is no senior secondary school in the Mo area. And so they said, what we would love to do is, like, uh, the, if we can build a school, the government will take it over and provide students. But as a community, we need to be able to do that. So we said, well, what if we, um, what if we, um, kept working on this but converted it into a secondary school and or what well, we didn't say that they said that and so that was sort of the the plan moving forward and um, so some progress was made but um, more interestingly is they started the school without actually having the school so when we went back the next year there was a group of students who they were attending classes in what had been the junior secondary school but this was the beginning of the of the uh, the Deg senior secondary school and um, which was pretty exciting and when we were there um, those students and our, our students work together to keep working on the school. And I just imagine how cool it would be to build your own school. So here's a bunch of the students uh, working on, you know, making more blocks and uh, even me uh, putting up some things. And since the, what was the library wasn't going to be big enough to be a school, we cleared some more land, built another foundation, uh, continued working on the walls, uh, put up the roof. Um, and when we went back during um, January, this is what it looked like. And they were still a little bit shy of um, an area, but one of the things which is just, a, a, I think, a heartwarming part of the story is that one of the girls in Nancy Alloway's class that had donated that first box of books, um, they raised money over the years, right? And that's where a lot of the uh, money for the cement to make the blocks and to put things together came from, was donations from this school. And there's this one girl who um, raised a, a lot of money that year, but every year since then, she, um, she's donated money to the school. So we were able to give them um, her donation this year, which was to finish the floors and um, on the school. So I happened to be in Ghana last week, and I thought, oh, I wonder if the floors are done, because Olivia would love to see that. And we were driving into the village, and we pass this building. And I was like, what? And I was with Crossman. He goes, it's the school. I'm like, that's not the school. <laughs> The school's not finished. Anyway, we like screeched on the brakes, backed up, jumped out of the truck, and sure enough, there it is. This is the part that was originally the library, and then here's the rest of the school block, and it's finished. The students are going to move from the junior high school. They just reported back last week, and they're going to move there. So it's sort of an interesting thing, because it sounds like maybe it's not a success story of a library. There will eventually be a library at the senior secondary school. <laughs> Um, there's also going to be an innovation center because this community is one of the ones that we work with in Ghana to do this similar creative capacity building. So right here is going to be an innovation center. Um, and uh, yeah, and uh, it's, but it, to me, it's just sort of this beautiful story about how, you know, things can be visioned and re-envisioned. And, you know, the community is, uh, like, school is expensive, senior secondary is expensive, and it's, uh, it's cost prohibitive cost prohibitive for a lot of people and it usually costs about 500 CDs which is about $250 a semester and the first year they opened they charged 60 CDs per semester which uh, you know they sort of felt like we want our school to be available to our students and so you know a lot of people think of it as a money-making opportunity and they don't they think of it as an educational opportunity so that's the library story and I think I'll close there and um, yeah, and open it up for if there's any other questions or, um, yeah. What's the biggest obstacle to you doing this work? So there, uh, so one challenge is the way that we do it because I, you know, 
I'm based at MIT, and so we are not, we don't have as consistent connections. One of the things that has been great is by running these IA summits, we bring our community partners to them wherever they are. And so we have a different type of relationship with the community partners, having gone through this intense design experience. Normally, they host us when we're there. Well, I've hosted them also at these design summits. And so one of the things that I found is we have much better collaboration. But the distance, like it's hard to do co-creation at a distance. And we were actually talking about that this morning in our curriculum. How can we, like our philosophy is this creative capacity building and this co-creation. And then we have students working on things in the classroom away from the community partners. How can we bring that together better? So we bring people to the field to MIT as visiting practitioners, but it's still not quite the same. So that distance is a challenge. Um, people are busy. Uh, and I, I mean that in, you know, when you're growing all your own food. So a lot of, uh, a lot of things are trade-offs, right? And, um, and recognizing how you can get things to work well within the context of the way that people need to be living their lives is, I, I mean, it's, it's definitely possible, but it is, a, you know, I think that's the challenge, and especially in teaching um, you know, people as they go into this field, I think understanding the um, intelligence, the expertise, and the, um, you know, just the demands on people's time, uh, that's one of the things we try very hard to do in DLab, and I think we, we do it. Um, you know, funding is sometimes, but it's also true that uh, I think just the, the Ability to do continuity and follow up is probably the the biggest challenge. Yeah. Well, I mean, what's the next phase? You know? Right. I think you know. So part of it is the supply chains that enable these things to happen because I I know that there are um, you know. If you look at some of the technologies that have taken over a lot, the treadle pump is a great example. And they, um, they created that very much with the market approach, whereby um, you know, everyone along the supply chain earns a profit along the way. The farmer using the, um, the pump, the person who repairs it, the person who sells it, the yeah. person who distributes it, the person who makes it, right? And so that type of um, profit-driven supply chain is something that will lead to something that spreads, as, as you're talking about. Um, I think one of the, um, the things that we're we're seeing is uh, the the USAID grant that Yvonne referred to is is um, one of the things that we're doing is sort of characterizing the spread of the network of these design summits and the innovators who come out of it and the things that they're doing and um, you know the the, the products that de they develop and the scale of those etc. So um, and we are seeing you know some of the people who've gone through that summit are now creating technologies that are you know being distributed. You know, a couple of them have reached the hundred thousand mark and hope to be in the millions soon. So there, you know, some of these things do. I think that uh, uh, scaling is not easy, right? And, yeah. and it, it, is, it is the challenge that people are looking at now. And the question is, it, is it through expansion or is it through replication? And there's a variety of, of answers to that. Um, we are in the process of uh, trying to figure out how to scale these things up. We have a new program at, MI, at DLab, which is called Scale Ups. And it's looking at <coughs> different models of scaling up through small and medium enterprises, through large scale corporations, through entrepreneurs, and just l trying to learn those lessons so that we can answer how do technologies go to scale and what is it that does that? Yeah. Two more questions. Okay. Yeah, over there. Um, the question we have is how would you suggest? Oh, thanks. Yeah. So there's lots of different ways to get involved in lots of different things. And I guess the. Um, the thing that I would say is I, I, I used to have a part five, which is a collection of quotes, but um, uh, one of them, <laughs> this one here, yeah, oh, sorry, that one there, um, is uh, it t talks about, you know, like, so what, what is the something that you can do? What is your passion? What are you, because it doesn't make sense to do something that you're not good at or, you know, and there's, there's so many needs that, um, that, uh, that, are out there in the world, right? And so, is it through, um, you know, is it through teaching? Is it through, um, is it through, you know, are you a creative technologist? Can you think of cell phone apps that have um, experience? Do you, you know, are you interested in water? Do you find an organization that does water solutions? So, a lot of it has to do with figuring out what you have both to offer and you have passion around. And then there are, I mean, there, there are lots of people doing lots of wonderful work. Um, and uh, and so I. 
I would encourage you to, you know, think about what it, because it's hard. Like a lot of times people come up to me and say, so what can I do? And it's like, I don't know, what can you do? You know, I mean, but that really is the response. Like think carefully on what, what would be, what should be your contribution? What, what, what really grabs you and what are you good at? And then once you have that, then it's a lot easier to figure out the answer to that. Yeah. Um, I had a question, oh, how do you get them engaged? You know, it's interesting because I had a, uh, uh, a young, well, he was in high school at the time, lived in Central Square right down the road, and um, he worked with me when I did a, a minority engineering program at MIT. And we happened to both play volleyball, and the national tournament happened to be last weekend, and I happened to run into him there. And we were talking about what, what we were doing, and, um, and actually he and I are going to try to work together to engage, especially sort of out-of-school youth in the you know, in that community through some of these things because I, I and, you know, there's a variety of things that also take this uh, approach, right? That there are the fab labs that look at that. There's, um, you know, so I, I don't want to imply that, you know, this is like no one has ever thought it. You know, it's not, but, but there are certain things about the approach which are appealing in that area. And I do think that um, uh, using creativity as a tool for development, community development, whether it be here or there, is, uh, you know, a field that is uh, a, a great one to get into because I think people are inherently creative. They like to be creative and it brings, you know, it, it brings something out of you to do it. I mean, those of you who did pile 14 books on your paper, are you proud? I yeah, know, uh, uh, but yeah. Okay, I, I think I kind of need to wrap up, but I do have a couple of closing um, remarks. So there seems to be a fair amount of paper. We can recycle and reuse that. Um, the books, you know, if any of them caught your fancy, the Friends of Robbins Library sell those, right? It's a dollar for paperbacks, two dollars for hardcovers. So if any of you want to buy any of the books, go ahead. Donations can be made at the refreshment table. Um, otherwise, if you can bring the books up here, um, that would be great. And I, um, is that all the housekeeping? I think so, yeah. So if you can bring the paper and books up and um, yeah, and have a wonderful night. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Listen, Zach just came back from Mozambique. Hi, how are you?